I enjoy complex games. This entails that I enjoy spending most of my time with games that look like this. And that, and also that. What I'm trying to say is that I relish the potential of the unknown, but it also means that I don't really know anything about the game that I'm playing. So, I decided that I will share with you my experiences in trying to transform a small community of Chinese corn farmers into a band of immortal gods. You know, uh, because, uh, because it's in the name. I'm also structuring this video as a review, but keep in mind that I haven't finished playing the game yet. That's because of my gaming pattern. I unfortunately have a habit of playing games obsessively for long periods of time before burning out and then relapsing. Unfortunately, it's incurable. I wonder where I got this from. So, instead of presenting all of the game, I will present only the things that I know and have done. Anyways, after completing the tutorial, which will fail to prepare you for the upcoming game, you may begin your playthrough. A weird guy will say hi to you and then he'll proceed to sleep in the first bed that you build, occupying your only room and forcing your disciples to sleep on the floor. Disciples of whom? The Tai sect. But who is the Tai sect? Good question. That's your main goal for the next 5 years or so of in-game time. I uh, don't mind the content, but uh, I do mind how it's delivered. You see, the best way to find out about the story is to talk to the people involved. That's right! The best way to find out who murdered all of your friends and family is to directly go and ask if they did it. Surprisingly, they won't murder you, yet. But they aren't exactly willing to tell everyone either. So, how do we do it? We bribe them, we get closer to them, and then we blackmail them. And we hope to any number of available gods that none of the characters are withdrawn, because waiting around for undisclosed amounts is not fun. There are other personality types, obviously. Apparently, you're supposed to beat up weak people and bribe the greedy people. But uh, it doesn't work. I've tried it and I can show you. The only true way to their heart is emotional duress. Now, you need to check your phone to find out who and where they are. Thankfully, every menu, entity, any event in this game has a comment box, so you can obtain some information from the other people schizophrenic enough to play it. I honestly believe, with all of my heart, that this is one of the greatest features ever. The comments inside represent the true symbology of the object they are describing. And thankfully, somebody already knows who you need to talk to. Now, you just need to get to them until they die of old age. After spending way too much time, which you definitely shouldn't, I found out that the story is entirely optional. As a matter of fact, it might lose you resources in the long run. Now, it's time to talk mechanics. And for that, it's time to talk cultivation. But first, we need the basic understanding of Qi. Qi, written as if you're five, depending on your belief, is the life force and energy of everything in the game. Qi is pretty much everywhere. In your wooden logs, in your clothes, in your food. Qi is in your third, in Qi in your air conditioning, Qi in your car. And everything that has Qi is subject to Feng Shui. So you'd better go back and watch those TikToks with a guy explaining how to decorate your interior. Generally speaking, everybody follows the pentagram. Objects that are tagged as Feng Shui emitters need to be surrounded with the appropriate element. With that in mind, let me impart to you some very important knowledge. Fire and water-based emitters control temperature, and 300 degrees Celsius is enough to set wood on fire. Keep that in mind whenever your character is bringing back paper manuals which are one of a kind and very important and placing them right next to some phoenix feathers. Now, back to our cultivation. There are three paths of cultivation and I can't pronounce two of them. Shadow, which is done through meditation, often requiring you to bake through certain thresholds that get your progress. So, if you want to get past those, you need to create your adequate temples. At first, your temples will suck, and there isn't much that can be done about that. After all, you don't have any of the materials, nor know where to get them from. For that, you need to explore the world map and plunder what you need. But what can you do if the areas are red? Go and explore anyway. As long as you don't use the enter function, you can adventure anywhere for free. You might lose a limb or four, but it's the price you have to be willing to pay. Xiandao laws respect the elements and every law requires its own temple. As you might expect from a game like this, each law has its own completely different progression and skill tree. 
Honestly, I don't really know why they recommend true side refinement as your starting law. The chances of killing yourself are extremely high. My advice? Pick Grand Chariot. It might be very slow to evolve, but at least you can try to break through as many times as you want. And with no risk of your spleen exploding. That and getting the initial earth-based evolution materials for a metal law is very easy if you know where to look. One day, Fu Chang, a metal cultivator of the Grand Chariot Wisdom Law, was taking a leisurely stroll through his sect's land. He had been cultivating all day in a room filled with stone essence, which had been painstakingly gathered by diligent outer disciples mining the earth. Fu Chang had reached a limit in his cultivation and was having some trouble breaking through. Thus, he was trying to relax and improve his mental state. As he walked among the fields, the forest, the hills, his gaze was attracted upwards towards the heavens. His eyes traced the clouds on the horizon and admired birds flying in the sky, before fixing upon a strange bird in the distance which appeared to be a flying snake. He patiently watched the bird until he realized that the small figure in his vision was not a snake, but a flying creature very far away. As he drew closer, he saw that it was a majestic dragon. The dragon sinuously moved through the sky and was fortuitously going to pass overhead. This could be the moment Fu Chang needed to help his breakthrough. Fu Chang lifted his gaze as the dragon passed overhead and he cried out, Great dragon, this one is Fu Chan and I wish to pierce the heavens. If you would aid this one in his cultivation, this one will surely repay you 1000 times. As if in answer to his prayers, something fell from the dragon above. It fell to the earth and Fu Chang ran to catch the treasure. He spread his arms as he was covered in dragon feces. Praise the heavens! Now, assuming you're not too picky about committing a dung eater, you may in fact get your hands on a large pile of shit. Believe it or not, the upgrade speed is worth it. Shendao cultivators turn the belief of other people into chi, as they do by adding them to the divine realm, which is dependent on your mood, mental stability and spot of meditation. I thought that I was doing pretty good, a potential 8 districts it said? That seems like it covers everything on that little diorama, but I wonder, what is the initial limit? For 49. Yeah, so anyway, fuck Shindao. Assuming your divine city is larger than a divine village, you might actually end up with a much better result than I did. Xiandao and Shendao cultivators are required to use flying items as artifacts to fight evil, but it appears that the material and quality of the artifact is more important than its actual form before creation. Meaning that, as far as the game is concerned, a dragon's third is a superior weapon to a sword or a brick. The third cultivation law is physical, which consists of a person remolding every bone and muscle in their body until they become probably not human. It consists in them sitting on their ass and eating 10 times the amount of required food just to be able to evolve. Fortunately, my guy has been eating floorboards for a while. It really cuts down on the food costs and it's really efficient. Plus, whenever he's fighting, I can use his ability to tap into that repressed memory of him from whenever he was eating shit and completely multiply his damage by a small margin of 10 to the power of 3. Now you might notice that there's this thing running around here. It's eating all of my food, shitting all of the beds and uh, it seems to be getting bigger. The spirit pet is great once you've stuck on yourself into caring for it. In all honesty, it's the greatest early game tank and you can abuse him to your heart's content. Since he has a chi pool of about 40,000, you can use him to easily curb stomp any early enemy. I think this is by design, since my greatest vanilla cultivators managed to hit stuff for 2000 damage. It only took 200 in-game hours to get there. But now my pet has 260,000 HP points, and I think it's getting worse. What else could be the object of your focus in the early game? Let's see. I know, building a mini-universe. Once more than a month passes, you unlock the recipe to the mini-universe. It being probably the main goal of destruction during the original sect's attack, it's reasonable to assume that it must hold some greater purpose. But it doesn't, it's just storage. However, don't let that deceive you, for about more than half the time of an outer disciple's day is spent carrying items around. Forget that, now everybody gets infinite storage with no item delay. As this other guy once described it, it's also the greatest septic tank ever seen, and I completely agree. Its true purpose is to allow me to clean up all of the shit that the animals leave around the map. 
Could I use that shit for my expensive cotton plantation then? No, not really. It takes too damn long. So I sell it. About every time the world merchant comes in, he's going to have to pay me to buy a literal tank truck of shit. And unfortunately for him, he has no say in this. He will take it and he will like it. Feeding laxatives to your people is a great way of increasing your profit margin, which in turn makes you into the greatest shit trader known to mankind. What other mechanics are there? Oh yeah, formations. Tired of your disciples dying individually? Put them in a formation so that they can soak up damage as a uniform Chinese flying sorcerer. Now they can all die at the same time. Be confused as your only question is, how on God's green earth am I supposed to understand this? To which the answer is, that is correct. I found the comment of this one guy encapsulates perfectly the amount of individual mechanics, puzzles and content in the game, and it reads as follows. I heard you like games, that's great, so I decided to put a new game inside your game so you can game while you game. This is as accurate as it gets. Anyway, here's a few more things that you can do while you are in this game. Enlighten an animal and have them turn into a human-animal hybrid cultivator. Use a hybrid cultivator as a physical cultivator because they respect their body structure so you can enhance their claws and tails. Give an object sentience and allow it to start cultivation. Have a sentient sword pillar walk into your map by accident. Regrow your lost limbs using a miracle. Grow some weird ass trees, arrange your sect into branches, have the cave of a dragon pop up in the middle of your farm. Unfortunately, this about is the extent of my knowledge. There are moonmen out there with the power and the skill required to translate everything that can be done in this game in 200 page guides. I am not one of them and I am thankful for that. And right now you are at least armed with the knowledge of what is ahead. All that's left to do is to clear the story, defeat the legendary beast in combat, achieve immortality, create the illustrious tier 0 golden core and create a monument to your seals by building every wonder of every sect you destroyed. As an intermission, I am currently on the path to developing the tier 0 core and I have no idea how people do it. As I have gotten to tier 1 to 190,000 points, I have since checked the wiki and realized that the tier 0 core is at 400,000 points. A lot I thought. And then checking the guides I realized that people are going for the incredible 2.4 million points golden core, so obviously I'm doing something wrong. Besides all of the endgame mechanics, you can enjoy the visuals, which I have to say they did a pretty fine job on. The game visuals are nice, but I think the menu art is especially beautiful with a very unique style that resembles old Chinese paintings. And they had the amazing idea to give out free wallpapers, which if not for my disorganized desktop, I would actually use. After all, we can't forget the music. The blend of music that they created for this game with its string instruments is wonderful and I've played enough of the game that I've probably developed tinnitus. Because sometimes, if I sit in total silence, I can still hear the main menu theme resonating within my skull. Anyway, I'll see you next year when I have the will of making another video.